the last time we talked about the Aki Richards equation and um, which we have shown here and we compared it with uh, Shuey's approximation and also the Bordfeld approximation and uh, in a paper by Castagna and a, and a few other papers uh, this relationship has been rewritten into this form where we have the variation in the reflectivity as a function of offset in the common midpoint gather uh, being equal to a, a constant a, plus a constant b, times the sine squared of theta, plus a constant c, times the tangent squared of theta, times the sine squared of theta. So we have these three constants here. a is equal to one-half delta alpha over alpha, plus delta rho over rho. Alpha, remember, is the compression wave velocity, delta alpha, would be Vp2 minus Vp1. Alpha by itself, or rho by itself, or beta by itself, would be the average value of the compression wave velocity, average density, average shear wave velocity. So <clears throat> it's kind of a simplified notation. We've talked about it before. And I think you can see, you know, if we take a look at one half, uh, delta alpha over alpha. Uh, we've got the average here in the denominator, V1 plus V2 over 2. We've got 1 half here. Uh, the 2's cancel out. We end up with V2 minus V1 over V1 plus V2. And similarly for delta rho over rho, we'd end up with rho 2 minus rho 1 over rho 1 plus rho 2. Uh, delta beta over uh, beta, we'd have uh, Vs2, just to indicate that it's the shear wave velocities that we're dealing with, Vs2 minus Vs1 over the average value, and uh, so on. Now these two terms are referred to as the, the A is referred to as an intercept, and the B as a gradient, this constant here. And uh, in the discussion that we're going to have, we aren't going to pay too much attention to this term. We'll talk about it in, in probably the next video but it's sometimes referred to as the curvature. And it's just one half uh, delta alpha over alpha. And again, this reference by Castagna, uh, his 1998 paper would be a good general reference to uh, this formulation here. So now what we're looking at here is the amplitude variation with incidence angle in the common midpoint gather. And I, th I think we're all mostly familiar with class 1, 2, and 3 anomalies. Class 1 would have a positive reflection coefficient. The zero offset reflection coefficient would be zero. However, we know that the AVO response is important uh, be, because when we sum all the traces together in the common midpoint gather, uh, we're, we're going to get a get an average trace which will not have an amplitude equal to the zero offset reflection coefficient. So for example with a reflectivity of zero which we have here for zero offset when we sum all the traces together in the gather we're actually going to come up with a negative reflection coefficient in our stack seismic trace. So these amplitude variations as, as we've talked about the, before these amplitude variations with offset are important. They're indicative of uh, uh, the, the change in properties as you go from a shale into a sand, whether it's water filled, whether it's gas filled, and uh, uh, we've uh, you know have a look at the preceding videos in order to to to, to review some of those ideas. Now, this idea of the gradient intercept uh, approach is you know again if we plot these curves up and we just look at these first two terms, a plus b sine squared of theta. We have sine squared of theta as our uh, independent variable, and uh, r of theta as our dependent variable. Uh, so we see that they're linear then in sine squared theta, and we have uh, these. We have a series of straight lines here. Almost they almost all have the same slope, not quite, but uh, the the slope is just going to be the uh, delta r over delta sine squared of theta. So. Sorry, delta y over delta x, more or less. And the intercepts, uh, they're basically the zero offset reflection coefficient. So this would be if we just had the densities and the compressional wave velocities, 
we would calculate reflection coefficients with these values if we constructed a synthetic from the reflectivity computed that way we would see significant uh, positive reflection here no reflection here a negative reflection here but when we sum them all together remember we're going to see something completely well a good bit different especially in the case of this class 2 um, response <clears throat> Uh, class 3 will see a larger negative uh, impedance contrast than we would uh, otherwise, just looking at the uh, normal incidence reflectivity. Okay, so this uh, intercept gradient approach for each one of these curves, we have a gradient, we have the intercept, we can plot them up in this um, intercept gradient uh, plot so that the class 1, 2, and 3 anomalies fall down here. You can see they have a little bit different uh, gradients. Uh, these two are identical. This one is a little bit larger, uh, the class 1 here. And then these are just the zero offset uh, reflection coefficients on the intercept axis here. So, so the intercept gradient plot, depending on where these points fall, we can tell you know, we, we, can, we can tell where the response belongs in terms of uh, are we looking at a gas sand? Uh, or, or, you know, we've, we've got decreasing um, uh, amplitude with uh, offset or an increased negative amplitude with offset as we do in, in all three of these cases. And for case one, this is going to moderate the uh, amplitude in the stack trace. For class 2, it's going to change the polarity from 0, or no polarity, to negative, and we're going to get an increasingly negative polarity for the class 3 events. So, you know, I've, this class 5, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure, um, well, I, I don't know if anyone has uh, identified it before, this class 5 response, but I feel that for sure they must have. And so we'll, we're just going to call it class 5 for uh, for now, class 5 events. Now, if we take a look at the uh, individual classes, we've got uh, ABO anomalies that have a positive reflection coefficient. Those would be class 1 anomalies over here. Uh, delta VP, delta VS are usually pretty large. Now, if we decrease the delta VS, the point will move up along the gradient axis towards the uh, uh, the uh, intercept axis, and uh, we'll, we'll see a drop in the R of theta with theta. So as theta increases, the, R, the value of R of theta will also decrease. We'll have a smaller gradient, in other words. Class II anomalies, uh, they have nearly zero reflection coefficients, so they kind of hug this uh, gradient axis here, right in the region of zero intercept. So uh, Large delta V sub S is going to move this point down. Uh, smaller delta V sub S is going to move this point uh, up. And um, again, we're seeing the gradient increase or decrease. And just, just to kind of come back here, uh, increasing gradient, talking about increasing fall off with increased angle of incidence. Class 2 anomalies, class 3 anomalies, uh, pretty much the Converse of class 1, we have a negative reflection coefficient. But again, uh, if you increase the delta V sub S, you'll um, uh, increase the gradient. You decrease it, you'll decrease the gradient. And, uh, and we, we see that reflected in the change of amplitude with offset, which is uh, uh, characterized by the gradient. So for class 4 anomalies, uh, we won't say too much about this, and they haven't been discussed too much in the literature. Class 5 anomalies, I, I haven't run across anything personally. We will note that these anomalies, uh, when we look at Paleozoic rocks, and in most of, for most of the time, the AVO analysis is done for gas sands. Try to differentiate uh, you know, whether or not gas is present or not, or whether or not you're looking at a gas sand, or some other... Uh, kind of a lithology. Uh, the AVO analysis is, is useful for that and primarily an unconsolidated uh, lithologic uh, uh, 
you know, sequences. So its application to the Paleozoic um, uh, hardened, very lithified uh, rocks is debatable. In most cases, uh, people don't consider uh, AVO analysis in the Paleozoics to be all that all that useful. So, but we'll we'll note that this response, a class five response, could be produced by the contact between a shale and a limestone. So here we're looking at uh, Paleozoic um, uh, intercept gradient plot, and it's based on the logs that we have over here. And um, so this is compressional wave velocity on the upper curve. This is shear wave velocity on the lower curve. You can see that we have a very abrupt increase in the compressional wave velocity across the top of the Purcell limestone here. This would be the Purcell limestone. We come down at the bottom of the Marcellus section, and we have a very large increase in the compressional wave velocity at the interface between the base of the Marcellus and the Onondaga limestone. And that produces these two points over here in the intercept gradient plot. So these points are significantly far away from what we might consider just to be kind of a noisy intercept gradient region here right around zero. A lot of the data that we see here is just kind of falling in this uh, uh, poorly defined region around intercept zero gradient zero. Now these points here are at significant, you know, they're significantly removed from this um, uh, zero intercept zero gradient region. So we have reason to believe that, that these are significant features that we might uh, see, at least, uh, you know, in a noise-free environment, we might see them. So uh, the, uh, uh, they're, they're more, the more extreme values in all of these quadrants may have some utility, may be telling us something about the uh, Paleozoic sequence. Now, if we take a look at this region that we just showed, these two points actually fall over here in a relatively small region of the plot that we were looking at before. So you can see that they aren't really major features in this intercept gradient, uh, intercept gradient space. And in fact, this point here has the most extreme intercept, 0.07, it's out here and the most extreme gradient, which you can see is very small, 0 0.035. And so it's pretty close, actually very close to this axis as we showed here, you know, in this region here. And that uh, light green dot would be this curve over here. And you can see that in a common midpoint gather, it would, you, you would not be very surprised if you did not see this. This is a very small increase in amplitude one that might be easily go unnoticed with um, even a small amount of noise in your uh, seismic data. So, uh, but at any rate, I just kind of bring these uh, class five anomalies up here um, as potential uh, utility within the Paleozoic uh, strata. They may be indicative of a shale limestone uh, interface, obviously not shale and gas. We aren't looking at the uh, soft sediments of the, of the Gulf uh, but we're looking at the hard rocks of the uh, Appalachian Basin. So the next time we're going to take a look at the Aki Richards, we're, we're going to take a look at another formulation of the Aki Richards equation that was put together by uh, Fatih uh, et al. back in 1994. And in this formulation, we end up with a three-term expression again, but the terms in the Fatih expression are uh, we have constants again, but then the um, uh, significant terms in this expression are the compressional wave reflection coefficient, the shear wave reflection coefficient, and kind of an equivalent uh, density reflection coefficient, if you will. So we'll talk about that uh, next time around. Thanks for joining us, and uh, uh, see you next time.